The Westport Library and the Quick Center for the Arts present an official Apple podcast, Oh Brother, Not Another Podcast, with me, Migs Burroughs. And I'm Trace Burroughs. And today we have with us Michael Kearns. He's an actor, an author, an activist, and one of the first actors to come out in Hollywood and to say he was gay. And when he did this, I guess it was in his early 70s, right? Uh, that was a big deal. Um, and I, there were a lot of ramifications, and he'll talk about that. Yeah, are you still feeling the uh, repercussions, good and bad? Because you've you've made you've been notoriety, had some notoriety. Oh, yeah, wow. I think I sort of notoriety. <laughs> 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 How's notoriety <laughs> different than fame, yeah. right? <laughs> or, in, or infamy? Yeah, <laughs> that's my beginning question for you guys. Yeah, that's I'm a good thing because no. it is, I am more notorious in a way than fame. I'll be the first to acknowledge yeah. those things. Um, yeah, it was a, it, it made me who I am probably, um, obviously, uh, and, and I think that the path was absolutely the right one to take, but yes, there's still ramifications. I think there are ramifications, not so much in my, um, mini world here that I live in, you know, which has gotten, gotten smaller and smaller during the last two years mm -hmm. in some ways. Um, maybe it's calmed down the waters and nothing much affects me about it. However, in the big picture of Hollywood, let's be serious, not a lot. Yes, there have been changes. There have been changes, mm. but not enough. There's still There's huge still amounts of fear of mm. homosexuality. Really? Fear that the, someone's going to get like AIDS from like being close to I don't I think that was an excuse of fear right yeah I think the fear is more entrenched than that and that's why the the virtual cessation of AIDS at least you know in a certain way that we live uh didn't really cure that homophobia that exists you know there there was a lot of outpouring around the AIDS benefits and the this and the by casting directors and people who would be going to their office the next day and behaving homophobically. Hmm. Jeez. <laughs> I'm, I'm, pictures in a waste can, one casting director <laughs> of, of people he presumed to be gay, many of whom are not, by the way, as we all know, anybody with a brain. But, you know, you can be assumed to be gay. You can be guessed yeah. at. You can be rumored about you can all kinds of things can still tarnish your career. I guess if you play a part, you're a good actor and you play a, and you're not gay and you play a gay part and you're really good at portraying that as a real, not over the top, like gay person. So, someone might, a casting director might assume that you, you were actually yeah, if you gay. do such a good job. Yeah. There's yeah. many, you know, boys in the band. I don't think everybody was gay in the cast, but you know, well, but here's my question. Do they assume that um, in these big explosive epic things that those characters go to the 7-Eleven on their way to work and shoot up a few people? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, it's, a, exactly. it's kind yeah. of a stretch of an assumption. Right. I mean, acting is acting. We can yeah. talk about that That's changed now. You know, I, I'm old enough to see the texture of what is considered acting being distorted in in this current environment what is and the some, change well somebody said yeah you don't have to be a danish prince to play hamlet i mean you know that's you that's what you well is that true yeah <laughs> i mean there's only one <laughs> danish prince. i don't know somebody will scream appropriation yeah yeah well that's, I mean, that's the buzzword here you know yeah. and it's affected the theater which mm. hello the theater is yeah, going this to is be yeah. This is what I don't understand why Hollywood got homophobic because there's a lot, there always has been, right? A lot of gay people in theatrics and, and theater and, and they go into movies from the theater and, and all the different arts involved in that. And, and why should that be like a big deal for, I mean, for them? I can understand if you worked at an, a steel iron plant in Pittsburgh, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> a steel factory but uh, but but you know in, in hollywood i don't get it 
Yeah, it's probably more open in a steel factory if you looked at the numbers. I'm serious. Yeah. yeah. If you looked at the numbers of, let's just say, out people, You're right. I would imagine there's more kind of acceptance and probably more because it's in, it's so it, before the first reel of film was shot, homo, homophobia existed here. I don't know why. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's all kinds of explanations. Oh, well, we won't, the classic, well, we won't believe the, well, people believed Rock Hudson, didn't they, for decades? Sure, yeah. There's a laundry list of people who, I'm not going to name them all, it's boring, but who people believe, Kevin Spacey, you yeah. know, people, and, and then the question is, who cares? Yeah. What does it have to do with what's going on on the screen when you're watching the movie? It's whether you're transfixed or taken sure. for a ride. Well, it's like outing somebody because they wear a lampshade on their head when they're having sex with their wife. I mean, it, well, who cares what they're doing at home? You know, I mean, it's so funny that you use that analogy because I always say <laughs> that a lot of these performances that Trace you you uh, reference, not specifically, a lot of the straight men playing gay men. I say it's like they have a lampshade on their head. Oh, really? Oh, that's interesting. Well, you know, they're they're nudging you. Yeah. Off. This isn't really me. Yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. not really this guy. Nudge, yeah. wink. And if that doesn't work, they go on the talk shows to let you know. And yeah. that's the first thing that said, oh, you're playing a gay person? Still yeah. that said in that tone. But did, did any of you... Ridiculous. Did, did any when you can, you know you came out very I mean early one of the first but did, are your other uh, fellow uh, gay actors feel threatened the fact that you you might you know people might start snooping around and wondering as well, I wonder if there's more of him you know and <laughs> what if they catch me and you know yes people will I say this and it's not a joke it sounds mm. like a joke that other gay men would cross the street if they saw me coming. I don't know what they thought I was going to do, like transmit some yeah, aura yeah. of gayness onto them. I mean, I'm not, I wasn't outing people unless they deserved to be. <laughs> well, Which meant, you know, people who were really going against AIDS or HIV or specifically going against the gay community. And well, now I don't even know you, there is a gay community. I don't even know what that means. Right. Chappelle, I don't know what all that means. I do know, but yeah. Go I mean, on. There isn't a straight community. I mean, were there straight people when there's not? <laughs> but there's, you know, I don't go to meetings. I mean, I, <laughs> you don't have green, you don't have a straight flag. I don't uh, know. What, yeah, that, that would be navy blue and <laughs> yeah. so tasteful. You know, gray. Maybe. But I did we, a straight pride. Well, a straight pride. Right. But I did. I went to Carnegie Mellon in the drama department. And oh my god! Pittsburgh. Speaking of Pittsburgh, I lived in Pittsburgh for four years. In 1963, I had shoulder length hair and I was the first one literally in Pittsburgh to ever have hair below their ears, to even touch their ears. And I would get, uh, I mean, I got beaten up once and, but people, I was called fag. People would drive by in their cars and call me a faggot and this and that. I'd walk down the street. I got punched. I got, you know, punched from the back, you know, blindly, you know, oh, knocked to the street. So in a way, I mean, and I didn't, you know, it was like, it really makes you wonder, like, my hair threatens them. I mean, they don't yes. know anything about me. And, yes. you know, I uh, guess, it, and they must, my theory would be, if you extrapolated from that, is that they'd love to have long hair. Maybe, yeah, maybe. And it was during the course of Vietnam era and the whole thing. And, uh, and, and those days, Pittsburgh police walked with German shepherds and um, they would intimidate you if they saw a, a hippie, you know, or something. Right. You know, they would I, intimidate you with their dogs. I, I got out of Vietnam War by saying I was gay and Me I had too. to go back twice and I got letters <laughs> yeah. and they and, and this is odd. Unless my memory has changed. One of the first times I went, they wanted me to take a shower. I said, I'm not going to go in there. It seems like the opposite. Like I'd want to go in and yeah, yeah, some right. naked men, but they, and um, I, and I just did this, like I was an actor, you know, and acted out this sort of, I'm sad. And, and then they brought me back and then put me in a psychiatrist's office. Get a call back. 
a call back at the army. You know, I got a call back. I got a, I got a first... call back. And, and, the, and, and, and I had gone to these psychiatrists just to get, all you do is get one letter. They don't look at those letters. So they see five letters. They think you're insane because it looks like a lot of therapy. Yeah. And, and, and they, and they finally, I just said, the guy, the guy says, are you gay? And I went, Yes. Oh, 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 oh. Have to, have to. And I got out. Yeah, you could you could have done some classes in that that gesture and <laughs> you're right. The, the shame. I, I buy that. <laughs> yeah, you bought the shame. Yeah, I brought the shame, embarrassment, and afraid <laughs> to admit. Yeah. Yeah. Well, good for you oh. that you you did that. Yeah. You appropriated. You were acting. Yes, That's I appropriated acting. the the thing. Yeah. So should you have been, um, let's just play this out, because you were not gay and you were acting as if you were gay, uh, was that a mortal sin? Mm. I don't know. I mean, you were playing the system. I mean, yeah, I mean, you're right. You could say that was, that's, you know, I mean, there's a, yeah. I was playing into their uh, prejudice by, you know, it was all at that point. You're talking about for me, life and death. I wasn't gonna. Yeah. Shoot. I didn't want to kill people, and I didn't want to be maimed and lose limbs. And so, whatever it took, I would have. But but that my you grandmother. Could ex- for- <laughs> but you could extrapolate that and say, would you play a white supremacist? Would you would you pretend to be a white supremacist if that got you out of the? Um, if it back then in 68, you're talking about a whole different yeah. time period. <laughs> the funny thing is I did a, a small budget movie, uh, and, and one of the characters was supposed to be a pedophile. And I, I, I wanted, and I, so I got this older man who's like, not by, by probably my age. Cause it's like eight or nine years ago. And he had a, and I really researched this. Like I went to pedophile sites and learned how they talk. <laughs> You know, they write love letters and to their 15 year old person they're trying to seduce. And I, and I, and I, so I learned a lot of, and I'd have that. And then the, the actor, I couldn't believe he said this to me. He says, you know, I'm not really a pedophile, don't you? <laughs> and I was thinking, yeah, you're an actor. You know, <laughs> you never, never, never thought you were a pedophile. I just, you're an actor. And I just want the actor to be an older man uh, uh, for some reason. He's also oh. a party clown. So I was trying to combine weirdness, you know. Well, it's very interesting that you're bringing this up. Pedophiles, if you look through history, and a lot of villains are played by gay men, gay closeted mm. men. Because they can't, if they know they're gay, or let's just say in the 30s, 40s, whatever, they knew that the actor was gay. They weren't, there weren't gay roles per se. There might have mm. been the butler who act fruity, and there might have right. been some yeah. parts I played. And, but there weren't that many gay roles. Now that there are um, all of those, you know, so, 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 so many gay roles, it's a different story. Yeah. Yeah, so what's let's talk more about your you, you, you've you've written but what's your current book is this the um oh that's the book who's of, afraid uh, of michael Crouch? Yeah. so see here's an example i would never have become a writer of the you know i mean i worked very hard but hmm. i wouldn't have been a writer if i had, i don't think uh, or hmm. not to the extent that i have or an activist to the extent that i have or a father you, I mean, so many things sprouted mm-hmm. from my being openly gay, more good than bad. Mm-hmm. Um, but I certainly lost revenue. I mean, nobody could deny that. I mean, then I started making it up as a solo performer, but there were lean times and then there are still lean times. You know, I'm, I'm an independent artist, you, freelance artist. You don't uh, have an easy road. No, no, you've been versatile. I mean, that's the thing of being a writer and you still go out to auditions and you still feel like you're I'm not playing. interested so much. You know, what happened was <clears throat> in the I guess in the 80s, primarily before we all knew about AIDS and we knew this mysterious thing was happening. But the industry so much didn't. There were there were some TV roles in the early 80s, even into the 80s um that i played that because then i sort of got this reputation as being a good actor not even a gay good actor but 
mostly in the industry, I was labeled profoundly, <laughs> profoundly gay. Stamp. I wouldn't have had any trouble at the uh, the parole hearing. So um, maybe I would, who knows? But I didn't. I just had to check the box. I didn't have to do what you did. You you were uh, heroic. Um, anyway, so then I played a lot of these gay parts. <clears throat> you know, the hilarious thing is people say, are you playing another gay character? What would anyone say to a heterosexual actor? Yeah, yeah are you playing that. another straight character? Another detective, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Another detective, another policeman, another brute, another pederast. Oh, I know, I was didn't finish that thought. I'll be yeah. there. Oh, I told you about the, the fact that they not, they camouflage their gay casting by casting the gay men in negative, oh. snarky, mean, murderous type. Yeah. Yeah, like you'll notice being... it now. Yeah, especially if you're looking at an older movie, no, but not even an older movie. I, I mean, I'm not going to name. Yeah, there, there's some actors who do not play screamingly heterosexual, and they're playing these characters. Well, you can sort of put it together. Your math, they're probably a gay actor. <laughs> That's interesting. That can that tradition continues. Did you ever get back in the day, like when this all started, and you had a part supposed to be a heterosexual person, and you had to kiss a woman, and they, they get it like all uptight about it because they're they, they didn't know about how IV, you know, HIV was spread and AIDS, and people got all paranoid about or stuff. even shaking hands. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Did yeah, you ever get shaking hands? Do you ever get someone saying like, "On that, I, can we just do something else? I don't want to like touch lips with that." Well, I never had that problem because at, by that at that juncture, I was playing gay roles pretty uh, much on TV. Yeah. So there wasn't going to be a then there was a gay kiss on one of those shows. My friends Peter Frechette and David Marshall Grant played oh, yeah. the two characters. And he went to our high school, people. didn't he? David Staples, was, Staples yeah. High School in Westport. Yeah. Yes. What was the? Anyway, it doesn't matter. Yeah. We, we don't want to waste time on that. But they they did. There was a big kiss in the eighties, I think, but not many. Few mm. and far between. Intimacy expressed between any two gay people. And then we remember when Rock Hudson, when it was revealed that he had kissed Linda Evans, I guess, knowing he had HIV. Oh, yeah. I didn't know yeah, that. Yeah, that uh, that sort of stacked some uh, thoughts <laughs> against him. However. It was unlikely that anybody was going to get HIV by kissing. That yeah. was the other. Yeah. Well, it's the phobia. You know, the, everyone's so the phobic phobia about was. everything. So then I started. Oh, I know. So you played these kickers. Then in the the '90s come along, and there are. Oh my goodness! How how progressive of them. There are HIV characters with HIV on TV. Mm. Usually. You know, they fall under the category of the pathetic, um, I lost you here a minute, the pathetic, uh, um, wheelchair bound, lesions on the face, mm. um, barely able to, you know, caricature. So I did a couple, you know, three or four. One was recurring on Beverly Hills, Nano 210. Um, but I would go to makeup at 5.30 or 6 in the morning, and they would make me up to look like what I kind of assumed in those days I would become. Oh, like so sickly. It was, horrible. It was oh. like a horrible exploitation of me, I felt, at some point. Because, you know, they'd benefit. Oh, we've hired an openly gay, publicly HIV-positive Michael Kearns to play this role. Mm. Dr. Russ. Yeah, all good for us is what it's about. That's what all those benefits and everything were about. That, yeah. That there's a quote in one of your, one of the interviews I read, it says, the whole AIDS ep epidemic is who I am. How, how did, what did you mean by that? If you said it, well, if that's a correct quote. Yeah. I'm, I think it is probably. Yeah. It sounds like something I dramatically say. Um, well, it, I just became so tied to it not initially as a I, I didn't have that as a thought process it just organically occurred that i started playing these characters i was involved in the activism aspects of it 
because I had a voice. You know, I, I, I uh, one of the positive things is I got on Nightline. I got on mm. in People Magazine. So I could talk about age just based on my notoriety. Um, and that's part of it. But then it just, it became a life's mission. You know, I still constantly write about age. I write about a lot of other things, a lot, 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 lot of other things. But even those things, if you really dug into them, they all sort of inherently have what I would say as an age consciousness, because it's they're about uh, dispelling myths and breaking stereotypes and looking at things from a different point of view. Even if my pieces aren't about AIDS, they're about that. They're about the marginalized, the forgotten, hmm. the, you know, ignored, the vilified, the yeah. all these guys. Yeah. Yeah, right. There's a lot of, I mean, there's different reasons people. Uh, so what's people your most, are. what's your most current project that you're working on? Well, now I'm working on, you know, I have ongoing projects um, that are always in the works for the next one, a, a writing group I have called Queerwise, which has now evolved 10 years, this is the 10th year, into, um, all you have to do is identify as queer. That could mean that you're an odd person who <laughs> yeah. gardens in their tuxedo. <laughs> that you could become a man. So we've expanded it because that definition is now murky. What does it mean? It's not about sexuality anymore. Right. So we and we started out as an older person's writing group because there was a dearth of older people of any uh, calling, one being able to go to a writing group. So that's sort of how it started, but now it's evolved and it, we do spoken word in it, spoken word performances um, all over Los Angeles. And we're always in preparation for the next one. So that's one thing I'm constantly doing and have been doing for 10 years. Then I'm an artistic associate at the Skylight Theater. So I'm involved there as a producer with a small P, but I am involved in some decisions and certainly in its edification, which has been difficult during covid there you know there, there's been no theater but now it's on the sort of revival or rejuvenation path which a lot of them aren't like i'd say half of the theaters in la you know we had a lot but they're gone you know, they, really? they couldn't keep paying, paying the rent some of them went you know sort of like some human beings do from check to check they went from rent to rent from getting the box office and they're gone when they don't have anything coming in you know, so that's a sad thing. So I'm involved in that. And then I'm always writing. You know, I always have about 10 things I'm writing, but I'm trying to write a memoir. I probably the hardest assignment one could give oneself of my father, just my father, sort of take him out of the family paradigm. Because that's what I've had to do to sort of reconcile my relationship with him is not look at him as my father. Oh, not entirely true but to be aware that he was another person and that person was pretty cool and i would probably love that person more than i did while he was alive my father so i've come to terms with a lot of just you know he had mental illness and and was not treated the way it would be treated if he had no, no mental illness today so uh, there's just a lot of things to forgive. And then, you know, once you add the mother to the <laughs> definition mm. or the identity of the father, you're really dealing with a distortion, you know, because she has her narrative. You don't know that when you're 10. Oh, yeah. She yeah. has a narrative about the father that she's going to, some mothers are going to put that in your head every single day and and whirl it around and swerve it around and make you believe pretty much what yeah. they say so i it's a lot of rebuilding so my daughter interestingly enough um said uh you should write a memoir about your father mm. and went mm, that scares me this death um but so i'm sort of begun some thoughts about that i think it would be, it, it, it's probably valuable for everybody to do is your daughter involved in theater? What is she? Doing? My daughter is, um, I mean, this is quite a story. You know, she was addicted to crack 
for pain and body, 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 body. My daughter is like one of the most at 27, uh, I'd say up and coming TV writers. Oh, I mean, oh. She has a very solid reputation and she's um, pitching projects. And so she's an amazing person. I mean, how much is nurture? How much is nature? Yeah. She obviously has a strong, developed brain that was not affected by the cocaine, by the way, or the, you know, she spent um, five weeks in an incubator. Oh, yeah. Wow. So she fought and fought and fought. And then she fought much of her first years, me, <laughs> but not, I mean, she just was a fighter. And that's probably why she is who she is today. You take there's another example. Well, mm -hmm. I was openly gay and this happened. Well, she was adopted and I mean, I'm not minimizing the problems with adoption, the challenges, and not, not according to that Supreme Court idiot. Mm. Who, what did she say? Oh, just they can just go out and adopt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Or they can have the kids adopted. <laughs> Is she kidding? Yeah, yeah. Is she, was she, is she adopting anybody? Yeah. Right. yeah. No. Each kid who is adopted has their own set of challenges, period. I don't care how, how pretty the outfits they wear are or how many accolades they get or awards they win. There's a deep-seated issue. They may not ever deal with it. Mm -hmm. I mean, my daughter's dealing with it head on and boy, it's, it's painful. And I had the door open for her to deal with it whenever she wanted to from the time she could talk. And um, she chose not to talk for a couple of decades. But now she's plugged into it at her own pace, her own timing. But I'm telling you, it's a complicated, unless you've raised someone or unless you are adopted or maybe if you've raised someone who's adopted, you don't realize the depth, hmm. pain, anger, hmm. et cetera, that is just toxifies as the years. It doesn't go away miraculously on your third birthday. Yeah. It's, it's annoying, ongoing. You have to work on it all the and time. Absolutely. And she has learned now in her late 20s, mid 20s, she started really working on it, you know, with in therapy. Yeah. So it's it's hard. It's hard for me. I mean, you know, I'm not, it's not about me. It's about her. I mean, and also she's black. So oh. imagine these last few years, she's dealing with the adoption issues plus the black female issues, which I don't know what it's like there, but for a black woman to go out and walk on the streets here a a after dark, for instance, no. Oh, yeah. Walk to their car alone, no. It's too volatile. Wow. Has she had any interest or impulse to, to find out who her birth parents are? Or? Well, she know, we know. Oh, you know yeah. We don't know who the father is. We never will. Yeah. They went through all that in trying to keep oh. hold of her. Um, she knows who the mother is. There was a, there were a couple of meetings. One when she was a tiny, tiny baby, and then uh, one subsequent to that when she was about ten or eleven. And the mother was. I don't even know why they had the meeting. I don't know why it. But maybe it was provided my daughter with some finality because the mother sort of came into a room. It was like a Christmas gathering. She literally came into a room from the front door, walked across the, the length of the room where my daughter happened to be sitting, kind of sideways glanced at her and said, oh, hi, turned around and walked out the door. Mm. That, that was her was Yeah. And I went there, drove there, found out the direction, tried to teach her what would go wrong or right or you know, everything. That's what happened. She was hoping for a, she was hoping for an emotional uh, epiphany. Like something. They, they, something yeah. like, oh, I'm, you know what I mean? Some tears. Some... Yeah. At least, yes, I love you, maybe. She, yeah. I'm sorry would have survived. I, I'm sorry would have gone a long way. Yeah, yeah sure. Yeah. Wow. Just I'm sorry. That, that's, 
that's like mind blowing, Ronnie. Really. Yes, and she was clean, by the way. That's the even more interesting thing. Mm-hmm. This was after a period of a year, nine months. I don't know more than that. I think she could have been clean for many years. Here's the point: being clean does not make you want to be a parent. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, and that's another misguided assumption. Oh well, we'll get them into recovery, and they'll have their ten kids back, five kids back, one kid back. Doesn't work that way. So, um, another painful aspect of the whole thing, you know, are the are, is the adoptee going to look for the birth parents? What is the lifestyle of the birth parents? How is that going to impact them from that age on? You can see how complicated it is. Yeah. And then what, make things worse, like the way this good. lady, you know, treated her like, the, like you, yeah. your daughter must have been ex- wanted to have some closure, uh, guessing. And, and that woman didn't even like, couldn't put in a couple of minutes of like, you know, I didn't yeah. know what I was doing. I'm sorry. And, you know. Well, Isn't it, it's just amazing. And what it did was, it made things worse. Yeah. Because now my daughter had the manifestation of what she thought of herself. Mm-hmm. Not that that was real, but that she was invisible. She didn't matter. She Nobody cares. Why? It brought up all that at age 10 or 11 or whatever. It re you know, it yeah. livened it in her. Yeah. Maybe that was a good thing. I don't know. But because I think that the, she did, she expresses, that's it. And my daughter is strong mm-hmm. in her own way. And then after that, she 12 years old, whatever she says, yeah, I'm never seeing her again. And I was sort of like, mm, that'll probably change. No, it has not changed. That's it. Mm. It's done. Now she may change her mind at 37. Yeah. But um, I, I don't think so. <laughs> I really don't. Yeah. Well, you but, obviously gave her a safe place to discover herself i would say you know um it could have been gone the other way i mean not with for somebody else i mean you're the she was seems fortunate that you connected well i think that you know the i i people all, always want to you know um thank you for that and i i mean i don't want to take too much credit but i was the credit i will take is that i was myself and she mm. saw me fight those battles subtly on a public stage uh, in my living room. She saw that constantly, you know, that I wasn't going to not be who I was and have some sort of authentic life. And so that's hard not that you, a, a child usually goes one way or the other. They reject all that about the parent or they glom onto it. She glommed onto it, not glommed, that's too strong of a word. She attached to it in a healthy way. Mm -hmm. Authenticity is the big, you know, parents like to put on their own masks and be the perfect parent. I never do this. I never lie. I never, I never do this. I never get drunk. I don't do, you know, they try to put on this thing, facade, and kids see right through it. I mean, not intellectually. Right? They all know. But, and there's nothing more refreshing than an authentic, you know, I mean, it was difficult. I tried to be with, because our parents weren't, but I tried to be with my son and I would trace it with his daughter. They're very honest with each other. And it's, it's a different. A different you know, thing. Completely. Yeah, different yeah you're in a different, I mean, you're a different generational. Different generation. Father. Yeah. I'll, not just to say that they're all like that, but you obviously understood but- at least that we learned, uh, and, and just for me, I had an epiphany early on when my daughter was three, and I was sort of ignoring her the way I felt like, I guess, my dad did to me for off and on. My parents were hot and cold. So, so, but, uh, and I remember the day that my the, I put it on my shoes and there were little stones in there, and I was already to get like all like pissed off at her. And then I ha- I actually had an epiphany. I just said like, this is, she's trying to get attention. Uh, th- yeah. Don't get angry. I've got a chance. want you to remember her and think about her all day when you're yeah. wearing those shoes. Yeah. And, <laughs> I and I went, oh my God. I was like, really? Yeah. I mean, it was a profound 
the act of that was profound. But what it was that she was doing also, I think, has some ramifications. She didn't paint the outside of you. She did something that would affect you physically. Yeah, invisibly, too. Yeah. yeah. You're walking yeah. down the street. Yeah. yeah, that was very... Very clever. smart. That should open your book. Yeah. <laughs> Stones, and that's a good title for books. Stones in my shoe. Pebbles in my shoe. <laughs> it's a, yes. I mean, it's a great story. And some parents, though, would not listen. They wouldn't have heard or perceived it as an epiphany, they'd have just gotten pissed off. And yeah. so what a loss that would be, that she was she was doing this big thing that she didn't know, she was just being a kid. Yeah. But it was such a profound moment that you had to listen for on some level or be aware of. Well, thank you. We're, uh, I have one, we have to go from the sublime to the ridiculous because there's one quote that I couldn't resist because I, you know, Paul, oh, okay. Paul Lynn was, Beloved, oh, no. I saw him actually on Broadway in Bye Bye Birdie. Yeah, I, was, I, I worshipped was, Paul Lynn when I was when like, I was eight years yeah, old. Yeah, course, and he's he was like the ultimate. Yeah, and you're just... anyway, you were quoted as I think somebody gave you a one word thing. They they sent out a, you know spoke a name and you just gave a one. I'm word afraid response. to hear what this is going to be. <laughs> <laughs> Well, they okay. Well, this is just two. So, the, whoever the interviewer was said, Charles Nelson Riley, your comment was conflicted. And they said, Paul Lind, and your comment was hateful. So, is there's that... a difference between them. Those are astute words on my part. Yeah. Okay. Charles Nelson Riley was mean, hmm. um, but it came from real inner, an inner world that was very. Fun. Can I say that? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, he just, I think that Charles Nelson and I tried to make the world a better place, tried to best reconcile with a lot of friendships he destroyed, drunk, et cetera. There, there are similarities between them. However, in my opinion, Paul Lynn didn't have any of those redeemable. Oh, yeah. He was just... And he got meaner and crazier. Yeah. And um, even though I guess people still bought it, I don't know what he was on that show. I, I, you, I, I, that was kind I, of his persona to being like the, uh, that laugh he'd have, like said that crazy, yeah. like like crazy uh, scientist let laugh at, or evil laugh, evil laugh after you say something really bad about someone and cackle, yeah. cackle, which is part a, of his uh, test here. So what did that mean in the 50s that he was cast in those roles? Well, right, diminishing. He was a closeted gay man. Yeah, right, diminishing, yeah. Because that's what he played. He did oodles of cartoons, all villains. Except yeah, when oh, he, that's he, right. he was the lead in Bye Bye Birdie. He played the father. I remember he, he sings that song and he comes out on yeah. stage. His love for it, Ed Sullivan. <laughs> What's wrong with these kids today? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he, he certainly had his moments of being very brilliant, but um, uh, yeah, he I was a mean spirited. Yeah. All that evil that he played, there was a reality under oh. all of Yeah, that was most of us. He did so well at it. You know, right, yeah. cartoon characters, but, they really seemed evil, that cat. And, and it's interesting because as flamboyant as he was or whatever, I, I, I never, not that I didn't think of him as gay, he was just, it was so, he was a cartoon. He, he, he was, was a, a cartoon. He was a cartoon. a lot of them are. Right. Yeah. A lot of them go to, that becomes their escape route. Mm -hmm. They won't be asked if they're funny. They're not sexy. Yeah. Now they are these guys. Yeah. But then, especially if you were funny in the extreme, like Paul Lind and there are others, well, Charles Nelson Raleigh, you don't you don't think of clowns having sex, yeah, right? <laughs> At least I don't. Thanks. <laughs> you know what I'm saying. <laughs> <Are> you... <laughs> Busted. <laughs> we don't think of the, those kind of characters they played, whether they're extreme villains, whether they're clowns, whether they're the butler bringing the drinks, all those characters that sort of fell into this fuzzy area. Part of the fuzz was not thinking about their sexuality. Yes. And that's how they got away with now out coming out of the closet. 
Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, it was a diversion, a diversion there. And then he couldn't play anything but that. Mm. Which is what that's Hollywood's fault or who I don't know whose fault. But um, he, well, he created that character, whatever it is, and that became his for everything he did. And he uh, maybe he didn't want to break out. I know you can get typecast in Hollywood, so he was always Paul Lynn wherever it, he whatever he did. You know, it wasn't like all of a sudden he's like well, that was his calling card. Yeah, I've never uh, heard of it. Talk was about. his calling card, yeah. and it was an ugly calling card. Mm. Except eventually. Uh, something happened. I don't know. I've read about it. I've been in, interviewed about it. But somewhere it turned on him, I think. And I don't think he could step out of that Paul end because yeah. he was more and more like the cackling drunk and mm-hmm. evil person that he was playing. That's mm-hmm. what it became. Yeah. Oh. yeah. Well, we're just uh, hey, we want to wrap it up with you just saying anything, uh, plugging, uh, mentioning your books and any no, no, stuff no, that you're no. doing. That for... I like just talking like this. Well, it's, it was great. Yeah, it was. Yeah. That's what, yeah. I hope you got some stuff right. Uh, I'm always trying to like let people know if they do something like this about things that still exist and yeah. deserve some thought and, you know, maybe to look at something differently and, pay attention you know that's all we we have to pay attention right more than ever yeah yeah no you know the world's in a weird place and oh my more compassion and uh tolerance and um you know i don't know instead of less which yeah yeah. some days seems to be the mindset yeah well we can do our deed yeah Thank well, thanks you very for much. Your, thanks for your time. Thank you so pleasure. much. So you'll let me know everything when when our my publicist or when, when yeah you know, all this thing probably within a week or so yeah we'll post what? it okay yeah because we'll get it out there oh thank you yeah, yeah. yeah. okay okay thanks so much Bye. okay.